Hey family, we are back inside the maze with another dose of the critical breakdown. We was gone for a little bit, but you already know when we come back, we come back bigger and better every single time. And this episode is no different. I don't know if you guys know the face next to me, but you better know the name when I say it. Boston's own award-winning actor and filmmaker, Johnny Hickey in the building. How Thank you, you doing? Awesome, amazing, amazing, yeah, I'm truly amazing. So, 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 so honored to have you sitting I'm right here. Honored next to, to be me. here next to you. Listen, to have I don't know if y'all hear that Boston accent coming through really strong. Oh, it's the real Boston accent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he's the reason why every time I go out of town, people ask me, "Where's my accent?" It's your fault. Johnny. Well, I love it when I'm when I'm out of town and I meet someone that's from Boston, mm -hmm. and I'm like, "Oh, what pot?" And then they hear me say, "What pot?" And they're, they're like, like, "Oh, oh snap. shit, I fucked up." <laughs> Oh, here we go. Yeah, so. Listen, we're going to get into all that is Johnny Hickey, man. It's the critical breakdown. Let's get straight to it. Now, listen, Johnny. I could run your resume all day long. People could search online. If you Google this man, it's very much uh, evident all the work that you've done. But we want to hear it straight from your mouth. If you could let the people who don't know who you are, who's Johnny Hickey? Well, like we were just saying, um, longtime Boston resident, born and raised, Charlestown, Massachusetts, Bunker Hill Projects, bust around Boston Public Schools. Mm -hmm. uh, my late adolescence, um, lived the life of crime, yeah. I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, pretty heavy, you know, everything from escaping from prison, mm -hmm. surviving an 80 foot fall in Quincy in the quarries, being a BMC for a month with a dislocated hip, separated pelvic bone, my bladder exploded, tore my urethra. Turning my life around and making a movie about that chapter in my life where I'm giving you kind of like a small dose because we'll be here I'm for sorry, hours. I just have to pick up my jar real quick. Yeah. I wasn't ready for that in the intro, okay? Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm gonna come, you said come, come, come with the resume. I'm coming with the, the resume. resume, okay. You know, um, you know, we could we could go two ways. We could go the true crime aspects, and then we could just go into the you know, filmmaking aspects. But I like both aspects, because both know, aspects make up Johnny Hickey. Yeah, I, you know, in school, I, I, elementary school, middle school, I did really well. I won two state science fairs. I was actually the only Caucasian male one yet to even be in the state science oh, wow. fair. Okay. It was just, it was actually pretty much at the time, like Japanese and Chinese kids were like ran that. Mm -hmm. No one else cared about like the science fair. I was gonna say, I assumed it was Asians, yeah. but I didn't wanna. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, but, that, but, that's, <laughs> okay. but, that's, but that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And I used to do these things called mock trials where we would go to the district court and, you know, act as a prosecutor, a defense attorney. Yeah. I won those two years in a row. So my education, you know, in, as a youth, I did very well. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was very involved in things and youth programs. And then somewhere at like 16, 17, 18, right in that gap, yeah. I just got caught up in my environment, That's you know, in the projects, mm -hmm. friends that were doing things, fights. And it's like one little thing would lead to getting in trouble, getting arrested, getting probation, 30 days. 60 days, 90 days, a year, three years, you know, so those are my bids broken up. I hate to cut you off, but I feel like I need to let the folks know because I think people hear Charlestown and think about, shout out to Ben Affleck, we appreciate you, but that's nothing. <laughs> that movie, The Town, has nothing on what Charlestown really is. Um, I hung out, let's call it that, mm -hmm. around the Bunker Hill projects and all mm -hmm, that good stuff, mm -hmm. so I know how easy it is to be influenced into the wrong side of things, right? So you build pretty much a career uh, as a criminal. I hate to say it like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I did. Yes, no, I did. I, I, you know, what happened was my senior year in high school, I left Charleston High where I was, you know, I was doing fine. I was okay. Mm -hmm. And the things I did that were mischief or trouble in Charleston, it wasn't like anything to get me really arrested. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to the North Shore. I moved to Gloucester. And those fucking kids tested me up there Ooh. for whatever reason. They okay. just, you know, I was a city kid. And one day I just lost my shit and I blacked out. I broke some kid's eye socket, put his head in the locker. And that was my first bid. So when I was 17 years old, I wasn't legal to buy cigarettes. I wasn't legal to buy scratch tickets, booze, none of that. But I was legal enough to go to adult prison. Yikes, okay. Uh, county jail, whatever you want to call it. It's mm -hmm. all the same though. And I was cellmates with the guy when I was 17 years old that was the first person ever convicted in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for murder without a body. His name was Joe Romano. And he stuck his wife in a wood chipper. And the neighbor who we borrowed the wood chipper from told the police that there was bones and blood in his wood chipper. And they convicted the guy on bones and, and uh, 
blood fragments, bone fragments and blood. I'm really traumatized by this story. I'm yes. gonna tell you a little story about myself. I hate to make it about me real quick, no, but you just in. triggered me because I had an ex who used to threaten that, you know, they might kill me and put me in a wood chopper. And I didn't know where they even got that from. But no, that's where they got it from, probably. Yeah, that's kind of well, fucked up. That's really, isn't it? Hopefully, you know. It's clearly they're next, hopefully right? they're, Yeah, hopefully reason. they're blocked. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't the same, you know. Um, you know, so I was in a cell with this guy, and he was actually, like, besides the fact they threw his wife in a wood chip, but he was actually, like, a... Like, he was nice to me, he was cool, he, like, cooked food and shit. Mm -hmm. But just, like, you know, I'm 17, and that's the environment I'm thrown into. Right. And you expect someone now to come out and just go, now Now I'm expelled from school, so everything I worked hard to do up until that point is now gone. So I said, okay, they want to make me a criminal? I'm going to be the best fucking criminal they ever seen. And I, and I did, and I just, I robbed drug dealers, and I just, I just, you know... The worst of the worst things you could pretty much do besides, you know, killing people, really. Mm -hmm. Robberies, you, you name it. In and out, in and out, like I said. Mm -hmm. I escaped from a minimum security. I had a 40-man apprehension team hunting me down for six days. No, I, I, I don't know if it's incriminating for me to ask you this, mm -hmm. but what was the escape plan? Like, how the heck did you do that? So, I was in a minimum security uh -huh. called the Lawrence Farm, the CAC. Okay. And basically, I pulled some political connections I had um, with the lawyer and some money I had on the street to... Uh -huh. I had 30 months I was serving. So typically, when you go into a county jail and you're serving like a long sentence like that, you'll do the, the first two years of the, the, the first 20 to 24 months of the bid. And then the last six months of that 30 months, whatever, they'll, they'll send you to like a minimum security, which okay. is still jail and it's still guards and cameras and fences. But it's just a little bit easier because you get to leave on work release in vans and, uh, and do okay. different things. Okay. Um, but you, you can't like, you know, just walk away. They'll, they'll snatch you up. Right. But so... I, I got moved six months in on a two and a half year sentence. Mm -hmm. And so they were already out for my blood. Like, how is he here with two years left? Mm -hmm. When I landed on my work. So they were just kind of like torturing me there. Like the correctional officers gotcha. at that facility didn't like that I had some power plays. Mm -hmm. And they caught me smoking cigarettes. And I didn't even really smoke cigarettes. I was just doing it because I was bored with some right. people in the room. And so they was they looked at that as the excuse to send me back to the maximum security to Middleton, where it was July, it was like 90 degrees out, and I was like, I am not going back to Middleton in <laughs> the hole no. for, for that. Mm -hmm. So I, they, because it was work release, some people would sneak in cell phones. So this kid snuck in a cell phone. And I was like, listen, call one of your boys because he was from the area in Lawrence, mm -hmm. and I'm like, tell him I'll give him a case. Of, at the time, it was cat tranquilizer, was like the drug that I was involved in in the rave scene. And I was, tell him I give him a case of K which is like 144 bottles in a case mm -hmm. and just give me a ride out of town which I had no care I just made the whole thing up obviously so he called the kid <laughs> had the kid meet me under the billboard and so during the day they would do counts so mm -hmm. every hour on the hour you stand by your bed and you're like John Hickey your number whatever and then you go back to you know about okay. your day so every hour on the hour up until like 10 or 11 p.m. and mm -hmm. then those hours till 6, 7, 1 you sleep so they just do combine to bed counts okay. so I knew during bed counts I could escape so what I did was I made a fake body in my bed with a with the beanie hats that they gave us, the orange beanie hats yeah. and the beat headphones, put that over that, and I made it like a body that was like, and it looked like I was laying in bed listening to my music. And I went down to the kitchen mm -hmm. when they do third shift cleaning, and I said, I need to take the trash out tonight. And my plan was to knock the CEO out in the in the parking lot, hopefully, and and climb the fence. And like the fence was pretty tall and had barbed wire on it, but there was a like a street pole next to it and a dumpster. So I said, if I get in the dumpster and scale up the pole, I can like kind of like get over the fence and maybe this not. This is literally you're clearly yeah, a filmmaker for a reason. Yeah, my yeah. Like, <laughs> like I'm either telling the story or I'm telling the story, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, it was pouring out. It was fucking downpouring that night and so I went out with this office you gotta go through like two locked doors so you go through like one locked door and then you're in a room with a you know guy in a glass booth and he's like sees that I'm with the officer and mm -hmm. then I'm going out to do I said I had to do trash duty because I made that up I just told him I had to do that because I got in trouble and so it was pouring out and I had the trash over my head I'm getting ready like alright I'm gonna have to hit this dude and he's like listen I'm not, and he's like so he's like just get, get down the dumpster get right back inside alright and I'm like oh okay yeah <laughs> And he took off into the rain to his car to the other side of the parking lot. And I was mm -hmm. like, dumped the bag on the dumpster, scaled the pole, and just threw myself over the fence. And because it was rain and it's on the Merrimack River, I landed in like mud up to my knees, just covered in mud, running through the farm, oh up on the goodness. highway. Got on the car with the kid. He was like, oh, yeah. And I said, oh, bring me to get the K. That didn't exist. I took <laughs> off on him. And then I was hiding in the rave scene. The raves were popular at the time. Uh -huh. 
and I was hiding in the rave scene and I knew how the apprehension team, so if there was a 40 man apprehension team hunting me down mm -hmm. and I knew how they operated. They, you know, tap your phones, do all this, your family, your friends, everyone you wrote a letter to. Uh, okay. And I, so I would go to Rhode Island for a couple of days to like in the rave scene. And then I call my mom, my family and be like, Hey, I'm in Rhode Island. I'm safe. I'm staying here. Knowing that now they're on the way to Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I'm going up 95 the other way, not of Vermont. And <laughs> eventually they got one of the cell phones I was using, one of the burner phones, and they traced it to where I was at and they caught me in Montpelier, Vermont six days later. Mm. And their recovery rate is typically 24 to 48 hours is the maximum amount of time it takes them to catch somebody who escapes just based on like, how people operate when they escape. Let me guess, did Johnny break that record? Six days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think one one other dude beat me that's like they never got, like he left the country and they never mm -hmm. found him, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but six days was like a big slap in their face. And so basically, I was lucky in the sense that I didn't get, I got more time, but basically the six months that I had in mm -hmm. got erased and got put back on. So it was okay. like, I, it could have been a lot worse. Yes. Yeah, it could have been a lot worse. Yes. So, so I took that on the chin, got out, and then when I got out, on that that big sentence that 30 month sentence i just kind of went right, right back into the you know the, the bullshit, the crime and mm -hmm. and i could I, so at, let's just get to that because at some point it is hard um to to kind of really make that change it's way easy to kind of fall back into what you know what got you in there unfortunately especially when all the regular societal things are against you the moment you kind of have that criminal stamp on there's you, no right? reintegration back into society Thank you. they don't give it to you, Thank you. they don't give it to you Thank they just they just they kick you out. I mean, now it's insane. Now you go to jail and they're giving you methadone and suboxone and just stuff to like keep you the revolving door, like, mm -hmm. which is why I just did this methadone mom movie. We'll, oh, we're so we can talk get about to that. right, yes, but <laughs> but so I got out and right back into it. And I could feel the negative energy around me. Like it was so bad. The things that were going on, mm -hmm. like just really like rough things I was involved in. And I knew one night that I shouldn't go out and I went out anyways. And mm -hmm. I went to a party at the Marriott Hotel in Quincy mm -hmm. where we had problems with these kids there. And, 13 kids jumped my boy in the parking lot and I was in that street mode still back then where I was like, well, I can't live it down. Like, I'm never gonna live it down if I let my friend go jump. So I have to go take a beating with them. And so I just jumped in to like help my friend. And I woke up seven days later in BMC, dislocated hip, separated pelvis, bladder exploded, tore my urethra. Doctors told me I never walk again. Doctors told me I never have kids, be able to use the waist down. God, whatever you believe and call it what you will, I got everything back 110%. Mm. I refuse to believe that I manifested walking again. Mm -hmm. And my urethra, which was the reason I would never have kids because I was torn, somehow numerically, because they can't like fix that, there's no way to go in and like stitch it or anything, right. uh, hailed around the catheter on its own. Mm. I have full custody of two beautiful girls now. I'm about to catch the spirit, um, oh my God. <laughs> That's and dope. I decided um, after that, after I manifested like against the odds of like what the doctors were telling me and stuff mm -hmm. and walked again. And I'm in better physical shape now than I was, you know, pre cliff. Mm. Um, I decided- You had like a rebirth, mm -hmm. literally. I decided I'm gonna take all this negative shit that I went through mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna make it for nothing. I'm gonna turn it into my childhood dream, which was to mm -hmm. be involved in film. Mm -hmm. I always loved film. I always wanted to be an actor or a director. I would love movies. I would leave Charlestown on the weekends, go to the Assembly Square Mall and while the kids were playing hockey and football, I'd watch movies all day and study mm. movies. That was my thing, horror movies, crime dramas. And so I said, I'm gonna write a movie about, and I said, let me narrow it down. Oxycontin, oxymorons. I'm like, I'm gonna take that specific chapter. Mm -hmm. I have so many different chapters in my criminal life, but that specific chapter is such a big topic right now that needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. This pill came along and all of a sudden, within a year, everybody I know, my friend, their, their sister, their mother, their yes. brother, the cop, the firefighter, everybody's on this shit mm -hmm. and people turn into heroin addicts. So I need, to, I need to make the world aware of this and this will be my redemption. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Johnny Hickey, the filmmaker was born. Got it, okay. Yeah. Ah, I love that story. And I feel like it's funny how life actually ends up working out. I had just watched a movie about the oxycodone to heroin transition. Now I'm like, well, did I just watch a Johnny Hickey film and don't even realize it? I no, I, you, I, you would probably know because because I'm in it. I'm in the film. Oh, you'll be in it. And, okay, and it's okay, scripted. Okay. It's a crime drama. But it, I, not only do I touch on... Uh, Oxycontin and the drug epidemic, I touch on racism mm. and neighborhood racism. And I explain, you understand why kids in Charlestown and Southie were racist. Mm -hmm. Like this is what they were taught. This is how you were raised and brought up. Like, they, And a lot of it was just this, mm -hmm. because then kids would go to school and be friends with kids from right. other neighborhoods and stuff. 
But in Charlestown High, it was like prison. It was like the Dorchester kids sat here, mm -hmm. the Roxbury kids sat here, Charlestown kids sat here, yep. three salty kids sat here. And we were a minority in our school. Like the Charlestown kids, there was like seven of us yeah. in the whole school. So it was like- A lot of the Dorchester, Roxbury, yeah. Matthew, everybody was Even the Japanese and the Chinese kids mm -hmm. didn't sit together. So it was yeah. this like segregation set up back then. So I bring those elements into oxymorons because it's, the truth I kept it raw and real mm -hmm. and I thought it might offend people at one point but the more it got out there and the more people seen it every walk of life every race people come up to me and be like man you hit it like yeah. you you really like yeah. made sense of everything and it like and, it, and I never expected it to adapt the audience that it adapted mm -hmm. and change the amount of lives that it changed I always said with my first film if one person watches this movie and it inspires them to get off drugs or do something cool I did my job That's dope. and now it's not like I have millions of fans, but I have thousands of people that still message me to this day. Mm -hmm. I have my kids back in custody of my children because I got clean because of your movie. I had a girl meet me in a parking garage the other day. She's like, you Johnny Hickey? And I'm like, yeah, hi. And she's like, you don't understand. Like me and, me and my husband came and seen your movie and we were both getting high at the time. And then it's we decided to get clean after we've seen it. Mm. And we've been clean and we have our kids and he's a unionist. And I'm just like, and, and I get messages and those are the things that like really motivate me and, yeah. and inspire me to say, you know what? All right, what I'm doing is like, it's cool, I'm a filmmaker and, and living my dream, but part of the deal is like, I gotta make everything I do about changing what's mm. going on and showing the dark side and the collateral damage of all, all the fucking bullshit around us. Now that's the first word that came up when I searched for Johnny Hickey for myself, raw. That was the first adjective that I saw to describe your movie and your filmmaking skills, right? And I think it's purpose driven because mm -hmm. that rawness is what's necessary to touch those people who are living that life who need to make a change, right? So I, I feel like, yes, you're moving in your passion and all of that, but you're also moving in purpose. Like you're the reason why you have that eye, it might not be appeasing to the, you know, everyday walking nine to five or who has no idea what that looks like, but to the person who's living that life, your work hits home. It connects. Yes, 100%. Sure. Now, speaking of your work, this new project we're working on, it's called, tell them, I, I would love to scream it out loud, but I'd rather <laughs> Matt, it come from your mouth. Uh, so it's a, so it's, a, it's a TV pilot or a streaming okay. pilot. Okay. We're, we're shooting to do a series. Um, so we have a one hour pilot done. Uh, it's called Method Mile, Okay. which is literally we are in Methanol Mile. Literally, right now. shout out to the record code. We're not literally. <laughs> wait, 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 we're called? like around the corner. Yeah, we're we're like, like literally around the corner. <laughs> you know, you can throw a little a dark. shot. You know, um, <laughs> but you know, so when I made oxymorons, obviously, like oxycontin was that first stage of this opiate epidemic that we're all seeing around us, and we've all been affected. But even if none of us have done it ourselves in this room. Mm -hmm. We know somebody who has, oh, and we sure. we know many lives have been destroyed by it, right? Mm -hmm. At this point, and it's not just here; it's everywhere in the country, everywhere. right? So, so that was the first phase. And meth, um, you know, the always the methadone clinic was always here in Cass. Mm -hmm. was all, so that was always a thing. Mm -hmm. But it was like people come early in the morning, and they and it kind of trickled out. Yeah. And then I watched it evolve into this like kind of skid row of Boston, where they say it's like a safe haven, and we it's clearly safe. no, it's not. No, we <laughs> clearly we clearly know that driving by there, it's just where they say, you know what? Don't go to Newberry Street. Don't go to Back Bay. Stay right here and you're fine. Right. You know, and it's like, oh, well, they're gonna have clean needles. You think that any of these people down there getting high or that are taking- That's what they're worried uh, about. You think they're getting up and walking <laughs> to the clean needle building three blocks away? No, they're no. taking the one in the puddle and shooting it. Mm -hmm. I see it. You can drive by and see it every day. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five times, go around the block, see it again. Mm. Um, OD after OD. Mm -hmm. And so I, just couldn't believe it. I had a family member that was down there. And so I went down to check on him and I was just like blown away. And I'm like, what is going on down here? Mm -hmm. And I found this kid, Andrew Rotundi, who was driving addicts around to methadone clinics. That was his job. Like he's a driver and he brings them to methadone clinics. Mm -hmm. And he had this screenplay that he put together about these stories of these people that he's been driving around. Okay. So I said, why don't we take these stories and turn them into a pilot for a TV series That's and create dope. characters, you know, embellish some things and, and make the characters of unique course. so it's not you know anyone's personal you know story that we don't have the rights to but like but everybody can say that this kind of stuff is really what's happening and going on down here mm -hmm. and so he was up for it his brother had some funding and an executive producer and said all right let's put this thing together um so i started thinking about cast okay for this okay um and i know 
there's probably been some comments. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about that really quickly. They had a, a lot of the bigger questions because we've seen, you know, Justina Valentine was kind of like the front, forefront face. Um, and that first question was, well, what about actors and, and talent here in Boston? What do you say to that? So what I say to anyone who questions that is do your research first before you say that because okay. my first film, Oxymorons, besides Tim Sylvia, the UFC fighter, is nothing but Boston people, Boston police, kids from the streets of Boston, and I'm talking every neighborhood. There's kids from every neighborhood mm -hmm. in Oxymorons. The, the, Patty Ross plays my mother, Boston comic, iconic Boston comic. The entire cast and crew, Boston, for my first film. Mm -hmm. My second film, Habitual, the psychological drug horror that I did uh, right before COVID, um, again, complete Boston cast. CT, um, who's also from Charlestown, mm -hmm. who's big on the MTV challenges, my childhood best friend. He oh, plays. It just dawned on me when you said CT. Mm -hmm. I love him so much. Can you tell him? I would no, tell him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so CT's a Boston kid. Yeah. He's a bo yeah. He's a big Definitely MTV is. star, but mm -hmm. he's also a Boston kid. Stiz Grimy mm -hmm. uh, from Chelsea, who is you know on the ra Boston radio in the morning. He yeah. was on AAF. Now he's on um, uh, the sports radio. Mm -hmm. Boston kid. Allie Duty uh, works at Phoenix Down. She's a North Shore girl, but she's still a New England girl, Boston girl. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the cast was just scattered extras for all in and around the Boston right, area. Right. John Doomsday Howard is even in it, who's a Dorchester UFC fighter. So my second film, nothing but Boston. Mm -hmm. As for Methanol Mile, we wanted to bring in kind of like a female star, and, and there's not a lot of female actress stars in Boston. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to bring in just anybody. I actually had Danielle Harris, who, if you are a fan of horror films, she is the girl that's in Halloween 4 and 5, the niece of Michael Myers. Oh, wow. And then she's also in the Rob Zombie ones. Rob mm -hmm. Zombie brought her back, and she plays um, Scarlett Taylor Compton's um, best friend, the other girl, mm -hmm. the, the sheriff's daughter. So she's in Rob Zombie's 1 and 2 as well. Okay. And she's like a scream queen. She's like a horror girl. And since I was a little boy watching Halloween movies, I had a crush on this girl and was like, <laughs> I want to. And so I connected with her at a convention mm -hmm. and then was like, she'd be good for this, like a, a crime drama. So I sent it to Danielle and she loved it mm -hmm. and she wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And then her agent got involved. Uh, and then that is that story. Uh -huh. And Justina Valentine, I met through my friend CT Dope. on a Champs vs. Stars mm -hmm. um, competition where he was playing for my nonprofit fight, the film intervening in high team, a nonprofit to fight opiate mm -hmm. um, here in Boston. Mm -hmm. And so CT was playing these champs versus stars challenges where people from his show were competing against like UFC fighters, football right. stars, mm -hmm. you know, this one, that one. And Justina was from Wild and Out, mm -hmm. was also on it. Yep. And so I met Justina out there with Chris. We hung out one night and we connected and she watched Oxymoron and was like, Yo, Johnny, I fuck with your shit. I'd love to like be in something if you ever do something. So That's when dope. I was doing this, I reached out to her because she always stayed connected with me. Anything I posted, she reposted, and she's got you know five million people following yes. her. She's a she is active every day. She, she is, is doing something. She's doing this show. She's doing that show. Mm -hmm. She's hosting the Jersey Shore reunion. She's on the cover of Maxim. Mm -hmm. She's at VMAs. Then she's doing her own other content. She's trying to launch. She's always killing it, and yeah. she always took the time to respond to me talk to me, support my stuff. And I and I found that to be solid. Mm -hmm. Her boyfriend's from here too, Roxbury, so she's connected to okay. Boston. So see, a lot of people don't know that either. I don't know that. <laughs> so homegirl's bo boyfriend who she's been with since I met her mm -hmm. is from, from the Berry. Okay. Like, like he's a real Boston dude. Uh, makes her beats for her and stuff. David, shout okay. out to David, my man. And, okay. um, and so Justina was gonna play the small role in the movie um, for the, like an addict that's getting driven around by the lead, by Danielle. Uh -huh. And, she was so adamant about perfecting the Boston accent and not messing it up because she mm. knew that was important to me. Yeah. And we all know, like, people come in these We've fucking Boston oh movies. Oh, my God. And, and, and it's just like, come on. You're forcing and if you, it. And if, you're not, and if you're not from Boston, I guess they can get away with it, and that's why. But, like, if you're from Boston, you're like, this isn't how we fucking talk. Exactly. This isn't how they talk. And so... Justina starts sending me, uh, you know, voice recordings and and then do FaceTiming with me 
and she's just killing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and don't forget, she's a, a lyrical fucking assassin, right? Jeez. And she's a character. Movie? And so, she, so what a lot of people don't know is she did a movie for VH1, uh, the Christmas special last year, Forget About a Christmas, was her movie. Okay. Uh, Nick Cannon helped produce it, obviously, as a friend. And she had all these, these other influences and comedians and stuff in mm -hmm. it. But she played all the characters like Eddie Murphy and Tyler Perry do. Okay. So she okay. played the uncle, the aunt, the this, the that. And so she's a character actor, and I'm watching her, and I'm like, she could definitely play a Southie girl that's a druggie. Like, she, I know she can do it. And she, then she pulled off the accent, and I said, this girl is working so hard to perfect this for the small role. And, the, and the Danielle, who I love and I want to play the roles, agent is just, you know, giving me the runaround. Mm -hmm. Justine has got an agent and a manager and a this and a that, and she's not even involving them. She's keeping this just between, keeping it real, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, like friends. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna have her play the lead. I think she's lead material. Mm. And I'm gonna tell you right now, it's the best, and every one of my team is the best decision I ever made. Yeah. Justina not only, you know, perfected the Boston accent to give us respect on the accent, but she really wanted to be a part of this because of the subject matter. Yeah. And because of what's going on here and help us with this. Mm -hmm. And then outside of Justina playing the lead, Lenny Clark, the most iconic Boston comedian, is the father. I'm in it. <laughs> Hello. Clearly, I'm from Boston. They don't get no more Boston than that. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy LeBlanc, who is in Gone Baby Gone, um, Spotlight. He's in every Boston movie you could think of. He's a, born and raised in South Boston, was an Olympic boxer. Mm -hmm. he, Jimmy LeBlanc is as Boston as you get as well. Uh, Allie Duty, who is in my horror film, my horror series, again, local girl, she's in it. And then the rest of the cast is all mixed up of Boston extras and people that we put in it. So for anyone to say that I'm not using Boston people, the only Boston person I didn't use was Justina. And please forgive me for trying to get somebody in this film with a name and an audience to help draw attention to the subject matter yes. that we're trying to tell. And don't forget, there's the real Boston character isn't the fucking actors, it's the fucking reality of what's going on in the story we're trying to tell about Boston. Amen. I'm not telling it about New Jersey, I'm not telling it about New York, I'm not telling it about Skid Row in LA, I'm telling it about our city. Mm -hmm. So for anyone to try to knock me for, all I use is Boston actors. Justina Valentine and Tim Sylvia might be the only two people out of 100 people I've casted that weren't from Boston. Listen, and I appreciate you clarifying that and setting the record straight. Let's just call it what it is, because it's necessary. People will jump to conclusions and mm -hmm. make assumptions, and then all of a sudden this whole new narrative is spent out. Yeah. So I'm glad I was able to get it directly, I hate to say from the horse's mouth, mm -hmm. but from the horse's mouth, you understand me? No, I would never sell out. I would never sell out my city. I would never just cast somebody because they have a following mm -hmm. or anything like that. When you see this and you see Justina's performance, you'll understand why. Justina's gonna go to big places as an actress. Yeah. She she breaks the fourth wall in this film a lot mm -hmm. and, and talks to the audience about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you're very attached to her. And she has that natural raspy she voice. Does. So she just she Shout just out does to the raspy it. voice ladies yeah, out here. Yeah. <laughs> and um and again, I wouldn't I wouldn't you could give me a million dollars to go cast anybody and I wouldn't change. That's I wouldn't change change what I did with Justina for sure. That's so dope. So for those that um actually not for those, for everybody that's sitting and waiting for this series to drop. Give us kind of like, what can we look forward to? So we're gonna take the pilot. We have um, a big festival that's looking at it right mm -hmm. now. I can't really say which festival, but okay. we have a very big festival that's looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. If it premieres at this festival, which I'm optimistic, it's gonna, um, it's gonna open up to a whole nother level. Yeah. Uh, it opens up my uh, credentials to a whole new level, mm -hmm. everybody involved. But in between all that, we are gonna do screenings theatrically with with the pilot we're gonna bring it to Boston obviously okay so we're gonna hit probably 10 cities so so 10 cities we'll get to Boston New York Chicago Los Angeles Texas Nashville Portland Maine and uh, oh Philly mm -hmm. and it's a lot of places that have uh, been affected by similar yeah. you know they have their own method of mile kind of thing going mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. So all those cities we're gonna hit with this. And we're now, gonna, I hate you to know. cut you off, but I gotta get this while you're on camera. Inside the Maze will be there at the release in Boston, right? Absolutely, okay, better so be. You heard better it right be. here first, okay? Better be, better be. <laughs> now I'd like to switch gears just a little bit. I appreciate you first of all for showing up here and telling us your story. I don't think my jaw has dropped 
this many times in one conversation ever, Johnny. I absolutely am invested, I'm tuned in, and I cannot wait to see the work that you come out with. Now, I wanna ask, because I am a teacher, you know, outside mm -hmm. of this, if there was any advice you could give to my media arts class or any little kids who might be looking into, like you, might run home and wanna watch movies all day, or they're into that media and film world, what advice would you give them? My advice to you would be something I learned later in the game, and you're only as good as the five people you surround yourself Ooh. with daily, okay? Ooh. <laughs> That's the first thing. So if you have five people, and I'm not talking about your family, I'm not talking about your mom, your brother, your sister, that, that's null and void. That's, that's your blood, that's your family, that you're always family first mm -hmm. before all. Mm -hmm. But the five people that are your social environment, if you're hanging around with a stoner, you know, someone that's not making film and hates film and playing sports, or, that's what you're gonna become. You're gonna become whatever you surround yourself with. Surround yourself with like-minded people. Surround yourself with, if you're an actor, filmmakers, podcast people, anybody in arts and entertainment, whether it's behind the camera or in front of the camera, that's your network. Those are the people you want to surround yourself with. As you get older, what I've learned now, on top of you're only as good as the five people you surround yourself with, mm -hmm. is the 33% rule. Do you know that one? No, tell me this one. So you spend 33% of your time with like-minded people that are doing things that you want to be doing, the mm -hmm. same thing. So I hang 33% of my time with other filmmakers, other, you know, hosts, mm -hmm. TV people, whatever, all, all, all in that network of media and content. And, and so that's 33% there. Okay. The other 33% is with people above and beyond me. So mm -hmm. people that got millions and billions of dollars to fund whatever movie they want. I want to I wanna get to that level where mm -hmm. I don't have to depend on somebody else to fund my stuff. I can fund my own stuff oh. and I can, you know, and I, can, I can recycle and redeem what I want to redeem with my own funds mm -hmm. as opposed to having to approach people and it's just, and it's a lot of work, right? So like you just take it to the next level, mm -hmm. right? Take the next level, step in, step up in your, you know, your audience, build your audience bigger, all those things. So you hang with people with bigger audiences, mm. even, you know? So like, say Justina Valentine's got 15 million followers on TikTok, 5 million on Instagram, and I'm hanging with someone else that's got 250,000. So now I'm, I'm in that world, mm -hmm. right? So now I got my 33% people that are doing things like me, 33% people that are doing things that I wanna be doing, mm -hmm. and then the 33% of the people that aren't doing the things that you're doing, like these kids right here, mm -hmm. that are looking up to me and giving back to them and helping them manifest their way mm -hmm. into that. And if you don't know what manifesting is, it's this, it's your brain, yes. it's mind over matter. The story I told earlier about falling off that cliff, I had doctors, professionals at Boston Medical Center, quarter of a mile from here, not even telling me I would never walk again, I would never have kids. And I refuse to accept that, I refuse to believe that. And I manifested walking, I knew I could do it. And you can pray to God, you can do all that too, but always, it's God is within you, so manifest. Mm. Manifest inside of you and never give up on your dream. You're gonna hit speed bumps, it's not an easy road. Some people might not, some people might just get lucky. You might do a video and it might take off and it might, push you right out the door and you might see someone do that and be like, oh, why wasn't that me? Don't worry about why wasn't that me. Yeah. You just keep, your, your your road will come to you. Just keep going down that path. Do not give up and never stop doing what you love. If you love filmmaking, if you love making music, that's what you need to be doing. You don't need to be doing anything else or worrying what the fucking Matrix tells you to do. Oh, come on. We can, we can have a whole episode just about <laughs> the Matrix and whatever you're trying to tell you to do, okay? But that was so many gems just in an, even in that message. Forget my kids. I caught those gems, and I'm sure our viewers did too. So again, I don't. I hate to even have to end this or wrap this up because I really could talk to you all day long. Um, but for those who are living under a rock, and don't know the name, tell them where they can find you in your work, Johnny. So you can find me on all social media platforms, The Johnny Hickey, J-O-H-N-N-Y-H-I-C-K-E-Y. Uh, Oxymorons and Habitual, my two biggest films that I'm known for, are available for free on Tubi, Redbox, Amazon, uh, Vudu, um, uh, and just, I mean, if, if you Google you know. them, yeah, they'll come out. <laughs> I, I always recommend Tubi because Tubi is a great platform that gives you great content for free. Right. You watch a couple of ads at the beginning and then then you can just watch the rest of the movie and okay. enjoy yourself. So I, I always I always push Tubi, but it's also on Amazon. You can definitely find my content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's dark, it's disturbing, but it's real, mm -hmm. and it's meant to it's meant to really rattle your fucking cage and, and, and step up the game. So, yeah, you can find me find me in all those places. Find my work. It's out there and. 
reach out to me if you ever have questions, if there's anybody out there that's interested in filmmaking, anybody out there that, you know, wants to talk about what they should do about their brother who's getting high, like both yeah, those worlds. Rap, but then I realized no, 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 but so both sorry. those worlds, like it, it is, you know, I, if you know me and, and a lot of people do on social media, I always take the time to answer you back, as long as they don't make it weird. Right. I always take the time to answer people back. I don't, I'm, I'm not on a high horse. I never forget where I came from. And I always try to like, you know, help people and give them the best advice I can give them. So That's always tight. feel free to reach out to me too. If you just want to know, like, how do I get involved in acting? Well, mm -hmm. I can send you down to Angela Perry at Boston Casting. She's a friend of mine. You, I can, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. I, I love to help people. So thank you for that. For and sure, listen, reach out. If you don't know, man, I, I, I promise you that 33% rule has just changed my entire mm -hmm. life. <laughs> Make sure you tune into this man's work because I promise you it will change yours as well, okay? If you're looking, oh, by the way, please tell CT for real. I love him. We will tell okay. CT you love him. <laughs> please tell him that. We'll tell him, we'll tell him, we'll tell him. We got, we got that. And CT and everybody else, if you're looking for me, you can find me at mismofilla.com. I'm not spelling it, but you can also find everything on socials under Ms. Mo Filla. And while you're at it, make sure you follow the team inside the maze on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that notification bell so that you keep track of everything that we're doing here at Inside the Maze, man. This is a very special day today. You don't understand. We got the one and only Johnny Hickey here with us. Ms. Mo Filler, man, the critical breakdown. Shout out to Inside the Maze, man. Peace out. I am blessed. Thank you. Amen. <laughs>